thing and then we will be. Oh, hello everyone. I'm here with Sterling Tompkins who was in Scientology. Sterling, give me a little rundown of your time in Scientology. I gather you were born into it? Yeah, yeah, I was actually. I was one of the uh, first round of the second generations that were actually born in uh, at the headquarters at the time in, in Clearwater, Florida. So uh, my parents both worked with L. Ron Hubbard on the ship. And uh, when they moved ashore, there was a little bit of a baby boom. And, and um, that's when I was born in 1976. And I was actually, I'm a twin brother. I don't know if you knew that, Andrew. And uh, wow. so we were both born into the Sea Organization, essentially. And I spent about five, six years there before moving to LA. My parents split up. And so I went with my dad and my stepmom and my twin brother uh, actually left the Sea Organization uh, with my real mother and uh, her husband at the time. And uh, yeah, so, and that, by the way, that half the family with my real mom and, and my stepdad essentially it, it are Jenna Miscavige's parents. Um, so I am Jenna's half brother. And of course I have some familial relationships to uh, the David Miscavige clan, unfortunately, but um, people who do watch my show do know that I was actually married to Shelly's sister while also being uh, Shelly's nephew <laughs> by marriage, yeah. by marriage. But, so um, this is something yeah. that, that Aaron explained when he introduced us. That's Aaron Smith-Levin from Growing Up in Scientology. People do go check it out. He's he's just the best at, at one of the best. You know, we're all the best, but he's the best as well at getting people out of Scientology and, and helping people who got out. But uh, firstly, I want to say that, that that's interesting because there was that film Parent Trap where the twins went with two separate parts of the family. And people are nowadays sort of reevaluating that and saying, hang on, that never happens. That's tantamount to child abuse making each twin go with a different aspect of the part of the family uh but that yeah. did happen in your family that's extraordinary and and then so just tell me okay because oh, people need to know as well david miscavige is the leader of scientology is tom cruise's best friend jenna miscavige i believe is his niece david miscavige's niece yes yes yeah and then what's my been... blood my blood so justin okay. and i were related by marriage to David Miscavige, Je Jenna is actually uh, uh, David's brother's daughter, so makes her actually uh, his niece. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. I can't. Okay, tell me one more time in the most basic possible terms about your relations to the Miscavige's. So, by the way, I, I, I have promised to do a chart on this, so I am going to eventually do a chart. <laughs> I might ask Kelly Copter to help me with that because she's so good at yes. this stuff. But uh, pretty simply, um, so David Miscavige and his wife Shelley. Okay. So let's just start there. So my mom, my actual birth mother was married to David Miscavige's brother, Ron Miscavige okay. Jr. They had Jenna Miscavige. My twin brother, Justin lived with, grew up with Ron Miscavige Jr. And my, my birth mother, uh, Biddy. And then they had Jenna. I went with my father who married another lady and I grew up with them. So just by the fact that my mom was married to Ron Miscavige Jr., I was related to the Miscavige clan, but did not take the name like my twin brother did. So most people actually had no clue <laughs> for the longest time. And there's a whole story behind that too, which is kind of crazy. But um, so we, we, even my brother and I were treated differently sometimes because of that fact. People didn't even know I was related. But uh, yeah, that's as simple as it is. So by, by marriage, I was related to David Miscavige. And, and then I did marry... Shelly Miscavige's half sister uh, when I was in the Church of Scientology. So I was related to Shelly and Dave in that way as well. And so it's so okay. convoluted and weird, but uh, I promise you none of it was incest. So uh, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> I, I feel like it's actually probably quite simple isn't it but it's just the way our heads work there's i always remember that uh gabriel garcia marquez book 100 years of solitude and at the beginning he's got a diagram like you say that you'd get kelly copter to do and i had to keep going but i think more than the average person i had to keep going back and looking at hang on this person's married to who because i just can't do it but I, i'm sure it is not that you know mad ron miscavige just right who was i interviewing recently who said that ron may have sort of forced their mother to give massages to oh you interviewed maybe was it mike brown yeah um, that's right yeah well mike. So mike brown's one of my longest term friends and he's he's actually an amazing person if you haven't if you haven't you know seen his channel yet or the story of his mom but yeah i believe it was uh it was ron miscavige jr that that forced her to do massages now of course the first time i heard that was about a year ago when mike told me that uh i have no reason 
not to believe it, but um, that was pretty horrific when I heard that. I was I was shocked about that. More more so the fact that she took the brunt of it and she got removed from post and, and was sent down to do the rehabilitation uh, program for Scientology. That that's horrific. Anytime that happens, and I've got I've had friends that have had almost the exact same thing happen because they're less important. Uh, they're the ones that get punished because it would look bad to punish the other person. Um, and that is a, that's a regular thing in Scientology and the C organization. It's so um, sad. Someone's got to be a yeah, scapegoat. It must make you reevaluate so much. If you, that's what you guys are current, constantly having to do. I've heard from a lot of ex-Scientologists. You hear more and more snippets of information, and then you have to reevaluate parts of your childhood that had darker aspects than you first realized. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, I've talked about it a little bit. I, I, I'm personally of the, of the opinion that Scientology or not, you can grow up with bad parents. And that's true. And I think I think I kind of lucked into one thing is that I did have really good parents that in a horrible situation in a bad scenario with Scientology did their best. Um, and there's a few incidents that happened when I was growing up, that were very, very traumatic, not related to them directly more related to adults supervising children that should in no circumstances ever be near children. And uh, so I have those. But as far as my parents go personally, I know they tried their hardest and they, and they did a decent job, I would say, of, of at least diverting my attention and trying to make things good. But there's so many kids that did not have that, that have way more traumatic upbringings than I did. And, you know, even to this day, you can still see them processing that. And it's really hard. It's tough. It's, it's tough. And I, I hate to see that with, with people. And I hope they get some resolution. Yeah. How did your parents then square being a Scientologist and a true believer in Scientology and also treating you relatively well? Because you're sort of, it almost comes, comes with the territory of being a Scientologist that you're supposed to treat children as though they are fully fledged adults, for example. And there are several other aspects of Scientology that make it almost impossible if you're a, a, a real adherent to the, to the uh, doctrine that you can't treat your kids well. So how, what was going on in your, in your parents' minds? Uh, good question, and, and something that I'm I'm realizing more and more as as I do the interviews, it, it's fascinating to me. So so my parents were, were you know worked with L. Ron Hubbard on the ship, executives in Scientology for thirty plus years, but they never shoved Scientology down my throat. The the, the information that I was an adult essentially in a child's body was not something that was that was forced in on me but then i'm finding out from kelly copter's story and and reese's story that that their parents were just i mean totalitarian nut jobs that would force scientology down their throat and i i find that fascinating that that i didn't have that and they did uh, but I do think it has a lot to do back to it. It has a lot to do with, I mean, Elrin, Elrin Hubbard's policies are not made for children and are detrimental to raising a child. But it really depends on how much that parent is going to implement those on the child. And I guess I was just lucky in that I didn't have that um, for whatever reason. They did not shove it down my throat all the time. In fact, the statement, you know, um, uh, you're just, you're an adult in a child's body never even you know, didn't cross, didn't ever come across as something that was said to me a lot. But, you know, there is a lot. It happens quite a bit. It does for a lot of people. But Justin and I, my twin brother, both did not have that experience. Funny enough. Did so. you at any point uh, as you, you know, be, being part of the Miscavige clan, in a sense, get some perks for that? Or was it just the case that people didn't even realize that you were part of that family? <laughs> It was different. It was really different. And I can only give you an, an example of a specific thing related to Marty Rathbun, who, um, as you know, is is one of the biggest villains in Scientology. Uh, well, can you yeah, a give it a, a sentence like of explaining just a brief, for those who don't know? OK, so Marty, Marty Rathbun, as you know, was it was a detractor. He did leave. He, he was he was David Miscavige's right hand man, his enforcer, his fixer. Uh, he also audited Tom Cruise. But just deep down, he's just not a good person. He never was. He was the type of person when, when people explain about getting interrogations, he was the guy that would stand in front of the door and um, stare you down as you were being interrogated by another individual on the e-meter and tell them how to direct the questions at you, would ask the very sexual and inappropriate questions that were to uh, be asked by someone. He was, for, he was a enforcer. He was, he was the second in command of a mafioso family, essentially, that position. Uh, everyone feared him. And just, again, not a good person. I mean, my, 
any experience I had with Marty while I was in the C organization was not good, just was not good. But that being said, <laughs> a perfect yeah. example is um, a story that Mark Headley's told or several people have told is that um, there was a survey done at, the, at one of the properties in Scientology at one point. And if you'd gotten that question wrong on the survey, or at least a set of questions wrong, you were instantly in trouble. And this was a survey that Dave Miscavige had run at the Golden Era Productions property. Well, Justin and I were both in the same organization on that property at the same time. We both answered the question incorrectly. There was a group meeting afterwards, and uh, everyone that answered the question wrong that night was going to be sleeping on the floor of some building uh, at that property and not able to go home that night. Well, I'll never forget, I'm sitting there and, you know, I'm in tears and, you know, I, I answered the question wrong and I'm next to my brother, Justin, and I see Marty Rathbun pull up on his motorcycle, walk over to Justin, have a conversation privately with him. <laughs> and then Justin went home that night and I slept on the floor. Uh, and the only reason that could have possibly happened in that particular case is because it was Justin Miscavige and it was Sterling Tompkins. So Marty didn't even know <laughs> that I was wow. Justin's brother and, and he would have no reason to know that. We didn't grow Are up you not together. identical twins? No, no. And we look nothing alike. Not even That's a little That's funny. Bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. I was imagining you looking the same and going, but hang on. I'd have just dressed up as the other one or, you know, vice versa. But obviously that wasn't uh, a, a, yeah. a possibility for you. I see. Yeah. Man, that yeah. reminds me, and it's not the same thing, but obviously I was at school when I was 15 and I remember they used to always shout at me for having stubble and the teacher, used, the, the head of the year, this like big scary guy used to come and shout at me. And I was often with my best friend who was the captain of the rugby team and he'd come over to us and we'd both have a big beard and he'd scream at me and say, you've got to shave your beard, gold, you look just awful, blah, blah, blah. And then he'd say to the other guy morning how you doing and just walk and he had this big beard and i i had to shave mine because i wasn't you know and i i do think that obviously that's a sort of much less serious version of this but i do think those yeah. kinds of cult dynamics and favoritism and nepotism extend into real life beyond the cult it's just that cults are an extreme uh, version of it but yeah oh, Martin, absolutely Martin, yeah Marty Marty Rathbun was also the one who was on site the Louis Theroux's My Scientology movie and i think halfway through seemed to regret being in it and tried to get out of it I know. And I mean, to talk about being able to watch someone lose uh, sanity during a movie. He was that was that was pretty intense footage when you saw him starting to lose it on that on that movie. That was something else. And Louis Theroux, I think, did a fantastic job. Uh, but ooh, that's a crazy movie. That is. And yes. and again, I did get some special treatment. There's no question about that. I mean, she, I don't know if Shelley just liked me as a person. But, you know, for a couple of years, I got gifts as, as the nephew to Shelly and, and Dave, but only a couple of years. In the end, Dave Miscavige did not like me. I, I don't, I can't tell you exactly why. Maybe it was my flippancy. Maybe it was the, the expression on my face when he said something stupid. I couldn't hide it. Um, I also Is that did true? not like my mom. What would you, yeah. When he said stupid things, what face did you make? I, it, if he was yelling or saying something and he'd be like, blah, 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 I'd be like. Oh, like, he wouldn't like that. Like, no, he, he wanted people to cow more than anything else. And I just, sometimes he would say stuff and I'm just like, that, that's, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, and yeah, so he, yeah, he did not like me nonetheless. And it partly had to do with my mom, I think partially, cause uh, my mom's one of the few people that she, she could have stood up to him more, but she did stand up to him a little bit. When, when he was beating someone, she stopped him from beating someone once and, and asked him like, what are you doing? What's, what's wrong with you? Why are you hitting someone? Uh, and again, she's told me she wished she had done a little more at that time, but she is wow. one of the people that just would not take shit from Dave Miscavige. Um, and he, he was psychotic. He really was. Um, yeah, you know. still is by all accounts. Is it true yeah. he would just go around <laughs> punching people? It is true. I only saw it happen twice, but I knew I've seen people come down from meetings with ripped shirts, uh, with their with their ID tags taken off. Uh, I saw him kick a couple people uh, after a meeting. Um, but yeah, he was he, you know, again, it's Mitch Brisker in his book talks about a little bit in a very good description. He could be completely charming, the hero and sweet. But then in the next second, he could be smacking, slapping or hitting someone or yelling profanities at, at, at women that are just inappropriate. Now, he never touched me, um, and I, I don't know why that is, but I, I wasn't on his lines as much as other people, but he never touched me. He yelled at me, but he never actually uh, laid hands on me, but he definitely laid hands on, on quite a few other people, unquestionably, yeah. Do you think Shelley would have had you as like a protected person to, for David? 
I think not when he was angry at me, but she probably had people keep hands off a little bit more than I than I knew. Um, but at the same time, she also tried to get my wife to divorce me when I was there, when I had been removed from a position. So she's an anomaly, Shelly. You love or hate her. It's, it's a hard explanation for her. I personally thought she liked me, but I'm not sure about that. I couldn't tell you for sure. I couldn't tell you for sure. Yeah. It's something that, I mean, you and I talked a little bit about off screen before, but there's a temptation to, I you know, have the baddies and the goodies. And because David Miscavige is the baddie, there's a lot of talk of Shelley Miscavige. We didn't talk about Shelley in specifically, but being the yeah. goodie. Um, and where is Shelley Miscavige? And it's become this big thing. Leah Remini's pushed it. I've never met Leah. She seems wonderful from, from what I've seen. But the accounts I've heard from Aaron, for example, about Shelley is that, you know, this isn't a case of like good versus bad, Shelley versus David. It's like he, she was very much his right hand, ma right hand woman. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, but to a certain, as a service facility more than anything else, I, I do think that Marty and, and other people, your Greg Wilhairs, your Mike Sutters, these are all, these are all lieutenants for David Miscavige, uh, were more of the enforcing arm for for david miscavige and were the people that um and uh, marty mcshane were the people that would could destroy uh mm. people's lives and, and made people miserable more there is a interesting argument going on about that not argument but but conjecture from a lot of people which i find fascinating is that how much does dave miscavige know about everything that's done and how much is done by these individual people that where they make a decision on their own to either harass or do things to people that are inappropriate. Um, and I would, I, you know, as more and more as I hear more stories or I even, even these files that, that Aaron spoke about that, that were turned over finally, the OSA files, um, it looks like there was also a lot of individual people it's to get to a position where you could hurt people like that in a very big position of power in Scientology or the C organization, you had to be able to annihilate people with, without any conscience. And that the people that rose to those levels had that ability. Um, you know, a lot of us that never got there, I, I wouldn't have done that to someone. I like to say that now, I could be wrong, but I, destroying someone was just not something that, that occurred to me as, as beneficial to anybody. And so I never rose to the ranks. I was always a, a pool I see or, or a tree I see or <laughs> something like that, uh, but yeah. What was the position that you lost that that Shelley then tried to get your wife to divorce you about? Um, so I was I was at one point I was in an organization called uh, CMO Gold, which is the Commodore's Messenger organization, an organization developed by L. Ron Hubbard uh, for people to run messages for him essentially on the ship. It then turned into a management body. I was in CMO Gold. It, I actually got removed from that purely based on on my relationship with David Miscavige because I saw. David Miscavige uh, going to the World Series in 1993, driving a car, driving a motorcycle. And I've been begin to question out loud, why does he have those things and we don't? Uh, being a naive 19 year old, 18, 19 year old kid, I didn't realize that that was <laughs> taboo to talk about the leader of your cult <laughs> in such a way. Um, but I really didn't understand. I was like, I thought we were all here on the same on the same ticket. Why, why does he got all those things and how does he have all the money? And yeah, so I voiced those things publicly and that was uh, part of my removal from there. And um, also at that time, I had been married pre just like a year before. And when I was removed, Shelly tried to convince my wife at the time to divorce me because we were in different levels and they didn't like spouses being in different levels because they share information that, that wouldn't be appropriate. I see. We, that right. makes sense. If you're a cult trying to, it, one of the most uh, manipulative parts of it is to have these hierarchies where each different level is privy to different uh, levels and snippets of information. Tell me, and uh, is there a difference, a fundamental difference that you found? So I suppose you can only speculate really about the, the mentalities of those who grew up in Scientology like you and Aaron Smith-Levin and people who joined it. And I only ask that because I'm thinking of the zeal of the, the converts, how people who join things are often just much more signed up to it. And the fact that you were asking questions like, hang on, why is this guy? You know, you were born into it. And like, whereas if you joined, I think I'd be like, nope, not going to answer, ask any questions. I'm in here because I want to be here. You know, is there any of that? I'm going to say yes, just based on that, that makes sense. I don't know a whole lot of individual Scientologists, but I would I want to say yes, but there's different levels too, right? I mean, Aaron joined at four as a good example. I always like mm -hmm. to contrast with Aaron on this. And 
you know, Aaron was far more into Scientology than I ever was. I never trained. I didn't do any auditors courses. I never used the e-meter. Moving in Scientology at the about the age of 18 or 19, I just lost complete interest in it. And I really just wanted to do my job and play sports when I could and and try to live a happy life. I had no interest in progressing up the up the bridge because I saw I also saw a lot of people that were OT3, OT6, OT7. And like to me, they 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 were you know, for lack of a better word, they were morons. And I'm like, what, like that's, mm. that's going to be the higher level that we want to get to. No, thank you. It's not, it's not worth the the time spent on the e-meter in, in a room. And I just wasn't interested in that. Um, and that being said, you know, like, again, I think Aaron just wanted to do his job the best he could. And I think he was very good at what he did. His, his knowledge of Scientology surpasses mine by light years. But, um, I do think there's a difference because like, even with my brother, Justin, we were both the same in that way. We we're kind of like, you know, we could or couldn't do Scientology. We really just wanted to kind of live our life and be happy and not be bugged by it so much. Justin, Justin was the first person of, of our family to actually leave. Um, and he just really had no interest in, in doing Scientology uh, when he was a kid, which is kind of fascinating. But I do think there's a difference. I do think a zealot will join at a later age and then you do have people born into it, which kind of are ambiguous about the whole thing. Um, and I also just thought, hey, why can't I have what other people have? Like, it's funny to ask that question. And I, I may have been one of the few people asking that question. I was definitely probably one of the only ones making public statements about it. But um, it just didn't make sense to me. I'm like, why does he got? Why does he have that if we're both here at the same time? And you know, <laughs> it was really a thought I had. But um, yeah, yeah, it yeah. Makes me laugh. You you don't like hierarchies and you know people being revered that's how i felt from a young age just in in synagogue i had to go to synagogues on sunday and uh, i remember seeing i was talking one time and some other kids my age turned and shushed me and they were like shush the rabbi's talking show some respect and i was like for what <laughs> this guy what is this guy we're all the same and I, I i don't lack respect for people who are beneath or but there is no other it's just people are people right but some yeah. people like those guys who were shushing me at such a young age they fall into that. And th there are people who want to fall into these things. And there are people who want to question them, I suppose. How we, how were you? I mean, was it difficult for you to leave? How were you able to start thinking about leaving? Leaving leaving was very difficult for me. And I think it had a lot to do with the fact that uh, my mom, um, Biddy, um, had already left with Ron Miscavige Jr. Justin had already left. And um, <clears throat> they, when I did end up leaving, they really tried to keep me away. Um, from uh biddy but it's it's funny the you know for being for having osa a whole organization dedicated to uh fighting fights for scientology and and science and critics they really are not the smartest people in the world they, they sent me to a, a a random family in atlanta and expected me to not call my only family member that was on the outside like why would i not call <laughs> my mom when i leave like what's your and so of course i called her right away and there's a it's a long story to that um and maybe sometime we could we could talk about that i don't want to i think it'll take too much time but i tried to leave uh following their guidelines so i wouldn't lose communication with with my father and my stepmom that were still in scientology and all in all that didn't work out in the long run i did stay in communication with them when i first left but as i started uh hooking up with old friends like Mark Headley, Claire Headley. Um, you know, they found out about that and, and my parents eventually disconnected from me, my, my dad and my, my stepmom, which is really sad because, you know, they raised me and um, I personally love them and, and think they're wonderful parents. And uh, that was a bummer in the end because my only crime was talking to Mark and Claire Headley, which is like, you know, and Mark and Claire were just trying to help people who left. I mean, they really were. They, they, yeah. Mark and Claire have been helping people since day one foundation or not all these things are not and i have to comment on that there was a whole kerfluffle as you know with sptv and oh, the, yeah. the video and stuff and and i i truly said what they did was stupid it, it, i did not like it but that does not take away from the fact that mark and claire have been helping people since day one and i've yeah, seen some yeah. other uh youtubers comment on oh you know mark fell off a motorcycle and now he's here no guys let's be honest one mistake does not erase that's scientology if you make one mistake it erases all you've done for everyone else Mark and Claire have been helping people since day one. Everyone should know that. Doesn't mean I approve of how they handled that video, but they've been helping people since day one when there was nothing in it for them. So um, it's funny because I want to make that statement. So this is a perfect scenario, <clears throat> but uh, that's I, what I think. I know, think it's true. They've been helping people since day one and that's, you know, 
That is I why think you make I a great to... point. Yeah, I think I think a, a lot of just about that is sort of SPTV for those who don't know, because some people listen on the audio podcast who are used to very different subjects. So that SPTV, suppressive person TV, suppressive person being what Scientology calls people who have left. And this was about the Aftermath Foundation, who helps people to get out of Scientology and to have a life on the outside. Uh, that was co-founded, I think, by Aaron Smith Levin, who's a longtime friend of this show, but also Claire and Mark Headley, who are also friends of this show. And they had a big sort of civil war going on, where I think what what you're referring to is is it was felt that Aaron was bringing the the aftermath into disrepute because of some of his private life actions and then a lot of people were saying well hang on that's the whole thing of Scientology was or any cult of saying like your private life is is bad you're doing bad things and you should feel shame and that kind of thing and it's I'm not giving I'm not doing it the, the credit it deserves for the nuances of the situation right. but you're absolutely right that there's a tendency within both people in cults people who've left cults and people who watch YouTube programs or who comment on them like me all of us like maybe just humans to take yes. one side and go like, the other side is evil, this is the good side, when in actual fact, as far as I know, in my experiences with Aaron, with Claire, with Mark, they are just absolutely wonderful people whose first priority, whether they make mistakes as they all do and as we all do, their first priority is to help people um, leaving cults. Yes. I'm really pleased that you say that. Yeah, yeah. And and obviously at some point, you know, one one person made the best comment ever, uh, Jamie, I don't know if you spoke to Jamie, um, I yeah, always forget mustard. his last name. Yeah, he made the best comment ever. It actually might have been with your interview with you, but um, like, you know, if, if you worked 30 years in, in OSA, you don't have a morality card to play, <laughs> which I thought was was so appropriate. And that's in, in reference to Mike Rinder. Now, again, Mike Rinder's done a lot of fantastic stuff. He really, really has. He does have a, a history and, and, and there was some mistakes made. But again, let's not forget, he's been trying to help people for a while now. Uh, yep, yep. And, you know, I may get some people hating on me for saying that, but my true belief is that now that's over. Let's move forward. Let's continue what we're doing, exposing uh, Scientology. A lot of my channel, I don't know if you know, Andrew, is about living life after Scientology. I wanted to bring a little bit of the joy of, of here's what you can do. You can find the things you love. You can, you can escape from your past. You can, you can uh, get well, get better, and, and erase the Scientological aspects of your personality. And it's hard to do. It's really hard to do. I've had an issue with um, taking everything personally. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's in Scientology, you do take it personally because you're being attacked. And so when you leave and you're at a normal job somewhere and something happens to you, your first thought is, oh, that person really want, has it in for me. And that's Scientology training because they, they teach you that two and a half percent want to make you want to harm you or do bad to you. So every time something happens, you think, oh, that's what's happening. It's a suppressive person attacking me. And it took me a long time to breathe and just realize that that person just may be doing what they think is best. They're not necessarily after you. And it's just a small microcosm of an example of, of the type of trauma that someone can carry from Scientology. But it is really hard, guys, to if you grew up and you lived your entire life to rid yourself of those bad behaviors. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. No, I totally understand that. And there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of guilt. And it's it's not fair to grow up that way. Um, it's also just the world. It's I... I I don't know. Sometimes I worry about the world. You know, I do see Scientology as like a <laughs> very far extreme extension of just what people are. And I think if we try and, uh, min I think we minimize it sometimes by saying it's like, this is humanity and that Scientology is a separate thing. Uh, even And I think that extends to all ideologies like the Nazis. I think we misunderstand where human nature can go wrong if we say, oh, those were just bad people. Yeah. And it's like, what, they just happened to all live in Germany at the time. It just happened to be this country of awful people. Like, no, that's what can happen to humans. Um, yeah. And I know what you mean with taking things personally. I've I've had a lot of uh, horrible messages the last couple of days. Just an hour ago, someone wrote, you are truly a piece of garbage. You are a terrible person and an even worse journalist. So those are the kind of things that we have to put up with. And I think if you're in Scientology, and, and it does get your back up, doesn't it? You don't, yeah. you know, you don't, you don't listen and go, oh, I must change my ways. You go like, screw you, man. Is there anything? Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I ask Aaron this a lot and he's always saying there's nothing that could have taken him away from Scientology when he was at his most fervent, but you never were really fervent. So were you hearing things and going, oh gosh, this is, this is right. There are problems with this cult. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And one of the main things was, you know, there's this technology in Scientology called the tone scale, which, which I think is complete <clears throat> trash. But, um, yep. but I remember L. Ron Hubbard specifically saying something about a level of antagonism. And if any group operates at antagonism or below, it can't survive. And I'm like, 
well, that's that's where I work. I mean, there's there's no one happy patting you on the back. You're not scoring touchdowns um, oh, for your UK crew. By the way, I do call uh, football football. Just so you know, soccer yeah. is called football. But there's oh. there's um, touchdown is obviously an American football phrase. But yeah. uh, there's no patting yourself on the back. There's no celebrations for doing a good job. It is all you must get it done. You're bad if you don't. It's not a fun place to work, and that that crept up on me because I was like. If, you, if we really saying we're going to change the whole world and this is this is a microcosm of what the world would look like when it was changed, I'm not in for this game anymore, guys. This is not fun. It really, when I couldn't just be happy and do at least a little bit of the things I liked, that was the beginning to my, my, my doorway out of the cult because I was like, no more. No Christmases for five years, I'm out. You know, stuff like that just, just drove me nuts. So, Well, who yeah. declared you for going to a baseball game? <laughs> that would be Chris Guider. I mean, Chris Guider was on the issue that 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 wrote it, and I'm not a big fan of Chris Guider's, and I've made that pretty clear publicly. Uh, but he, yeah, he declared me for going to a baseball game. <laughs> um, I know, right? The most on the Fourth of July too. So the most American thing you can do. Uh, yeah, he declared me because they had nothing else on me, Andrew. They had nothing. Like I really didn't do anything wrong to anyone. I never sec check person. I never had an out tech because I never applied the tech to people. Um, and mm. I think that's, they were just, they were just fishing uh, for something. And, and the fact that I in broad daylight left the building, walked up Elrond Hubbard way and took a bus to Dodger stadium and then came back at the end of the day and told my auditor at the time, that's what I did. That's that, that was their big gotcha moment, uh, which mm. was pretty lame in the, <laughs> it's pretty lame, right? <laughs> I think sometimes it's the bigotry of small differences, which is just that if you were this like really against them kind of person, they'd almost give you more leeway. And because it's like, no, I'm actually just towing the line, but I'm doing something slightly different to what you guys would do. Um, I've been penalized on this channel for using the, the word before, so I'll have to spell it out, but W-O-G, because it also no. refers to an African-American slur, but it's it's a Scientolo Scientological way of, of saying like the worldly people, as the Jehovah's Witnesses would have it. Uh, and I guess, is that the problem of going to baseball? It's it's a worldly activity? Worldly activity, and essentially, I you know, I was sleeping on the floor uh in a in the bottom wing of of the big blue building on sunset and no one was really paying attention to me so i think they were kind of just waiting to see if i would make a mistake that could give them a justification mm. to do something and it probably annoyed them that i was just biding my time and and not making any noise uh mm -hmm. but my brother lent me money to go to the baseball game so i was like hey i'm going and uh yeah i guess that just rubbed them the wrong way i don't you know no other explanation that for that one. It was a strange, strange thing. What is, is that? A, is that a rule about uh, not going? Because, because I, I mean, John Travolta and Tom Cruise take part in worldly activities. What's the rule with baseball? Oh yeah, so no, because I was a C organization member. Um, you know, you don't get a lot of time off, if any, and so I was supposed ah. to essentially be under lockdown, but no one was really paying attention. So I could have gone to Starbucks for a coffee and been totally okay. But I went all the way to a baseball game, you know, over like seven miles away from that location, spent a day doing a fun activity, which I did not have authorization to do, and then came back. I see. It's I see. sort of weird. I might be the only person that's ever done that particular thing because usually when you blow, you leave and don't come back. But I had nowhere to sleep that night, so I had to come back. I didn't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally understand. Um, well, yeah. this this guy, he was sec checking you, wasn't he? And then made up a you you had made up a story about something. What was that about? Oh, that was Chris Guider. Yes, that that was before that was before all of this happened. Yeah, I was okay. working in marketing. I was I was doing uh, design production and marketing. So I would I would do pre press for for the basics uh, books, the covers, the CDs, and uh, I had mismeasured the logo on the spine, the dust jackets of a few of the basic books by. I think like a 16th of an inch. And um, so someone wanted to make a big deal about that. I, it's insane. And um, so they, they had put me on, on the meter to uh, sec check me or interrogate me. Now, previous to this, I had already been interrogated like in the previous three months. So at some point you do actually run out of things to, to say. Uh, and you do, and I, I believe that I had started having doubts about their their electro psychometer, their e-meter, the, the, the lie detector. Um, so I got to the point where I, I didn't care anymore. And so they're, they're interrogating me and they're trying to find something. There was nothing there. And I, I just, in a, in a brief moment, I thought, 
you know, why don't I test a theory here? Why don't I make something up completely from scratch, tell the story like it's real and see what happens? So um, I tell this entire, uh, look at the, the marketing, the top floor of marketing is, a, is an open floor plan. They have artist tables all over the place. Uh, I don't know how, how descript I can be in this story, Andrew, uh, but um, essentially I made up that I had an affair with one of the more attractive ladies in, in, in marketing and that every night after everyone went home, I would, I would, uh, I would continue that affair with this lady over and over again. And as I was telling the story, you know, the, the auditor's eyes, the interrogator's eyes were lighting up. He was like, I got it. I got it. Cause you know, these, these people have to report back to Dave on these details and they really wanted to get a gotcha moment. Like we got Sterling yeah. on this and Dave, since day one had been just, hyper focused as, as regards to me, hyper focused on me and women for some reason. Like he always thought I may have been doing something inappropriate and I don't know why that was, um, but he, he was a nut job. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I make up this entire story, the needles floating at the end and the auditor goes, so is that all you have to say about that? And uh, I go, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. He goes, well, thank you for telling me. And I said, okay, did my needle float? And he goes, yeah, yeah, it did. And I said, you're an idiot. And, and then his, oh, you his said face that. goes, oh yeah, oh yeah. His face went blank. I'm like, no. I said, you're an idiot. I made that entire story up. Did it really read on that meter? And he's like, and he just was like flustered and blah, blah, blah. And the session ended right there. <laughs> oh, and that was the guy who got you for going to a baseball game. Yes, yes. Well, that's why. I think he was, I think he was really upset about that after that because he, yeah, that, that did not look good. That did not look good on him. Um Bloody hell. What do you think it is then? Because people, everyone gives me a different answer. Is it some sort of lie detector? Because even lie detectors they use in courts and things, I think are 60 to 80% accurate, which is not really good enough. That's why you can't really put someone away for it. So is it some, right. based on that? I think it's, I don't really know. And Andrew, I, it was just, I didn't really care either. Um, I don't know how it works. I, I think it's like, the the thing that always got me is like, they have these, 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 me, like the needle moves back and forth, right? And it's a certain needle movement that would explain mm. some phenomena. And I was always like, why don't you just have a digital display that once the, once you pick up that particular read, it just says, you know, dirty needle or, or person's happy. Why, why do you have to interpret a needle that's so easy to misinterpret? So I really never understood it. It, it was, it was, it was all just a weird, different esoteric language to me. Um, and it's why I never wanted to be an auditor. It, it was so stupid Man. to me. I don't know. It, it, so, it sounds stupid to say that, but it really was, it did not make sense to me ever, even when I was a little kid. So, Where do you think, and I know we've had answers to this. I, Aaron Smith-Levin's given one, for example, but where do you think Shelley Miss Cabbage is now? I... Uh, I think she's up at, up at the uh, Church of Scientology, spiritual technology property up in, um, where is it, Crestline or something like that. And mm. you know, it's funny, a lot of people, I've heard a lot of uh, backlash about, well, who cares where Shelly is? Why is that even, why is that even a, a thing? And who cares if this person was David Miscavige's secondhand person, or it's not secondhand, but you know, right-hand person. She's done a lot of bad things to people or seen things happen to people. All of that's true. I just think it's something that's tangible. It's something that you can point a finger at specifically and go, Dave Miscavige, look, his wife is no longer there and he doesn't talk about it. And of course, it's made it on award shows now too, right? I don't know if you saw that. Like I believe at the Oscars or something, even a joke was made about, about that. Um, so I agree with some people. It's not such an important thing where Shelly is, but it also does bring a lot of attention to Dave Miscavige and his character. Therefore, I do think it's valuable to that degree. Uh, I don't know where she's at. I'm only going to conjecture that she's at that property because it would make the most sense that she would be there. Yeah. And quite possibly of her own volition. Yeah. You know, and, and also she might be happy doing her thing. She's in a cult. She's, she's brainwashed. She's been there since she was what, nine or 10 years old. Hmm. We can't assume that she's not happy doing what she's doing right now. She, you look, if you're away from David Miscavige, life's going to be a lot better. That's a fact. Being close to him is not fun. It's painful. So when he leaves, I remember when he used to leave Golden Air Productions, the base, there was a calmness, a, a serenity that just swept over the entire place knowing he was not there. You didn't have to worry about him walking in and blowing you away. And one day you're on your job and the next day 
you're, you're out scrubbing toilets in, in, in the garage. You know, there was a niceness about not having him there. Because he's what's some of the worst stuff? Well, you know what? I was actually, I was just going to say it's almost like you'd rather, if there were one thing that everybody, like a marketable thing to hang your hat on for everybody at award ceremonies to say, you'd almost rather it be something like uh, the death of Lisa McPherson, uh, something where it's like even more like, look how bad what you guys have done is. But that one didn't yeah. sort of catch the same way that uh, whereas Shelley Miscavige did. Yeah, because the death part of it, I think, is something that you don't want to uh, make any sort of reference to a joke. But a missing wife, yes, I don't know. It can lend itself maybe to some be a little bit less harsh uh, coming out of someone's mouth. Um, but can you imagine his feel? Look at Dave Miscavige can't go. Like I'm sure he wants to hob, hob at Hollywood parties. I'm sure he wants to meet agents. I'm sure he would love to go with Tom Cruise at parties. That dude's a pariah, man. You can't take that guy out anywhere. Everyone's going to be yeah. whispering in the corner when he makes a public appearance. It's got to suck for him. Makes yeah, me and happy. yet, somehow, somehow, and I've often said this, you know, uh, I don't know. I was almost going to say it the other day. Um, I was on that podcast, Trigonometry, and at the end they always ask, what's the one thing no one's talking about that everybody should be? And I just, I didn't say it in the end because I thought it's not quite right for their podcast. But I was going to say, like, if aliens came down today and they looked at our society and they, they, I think they'd go, hang on, what's the weirdest thing here? And I think the weirdest thing is that probably the world's most famous superstar actor is pretty much the head of the cult. I mean, it, he, I know he doesn't necessarily have political power, but he does, doesn't he? Because without Tom yeah. Cruise, there's no Scientology. How is he getting away with it? Whereas David Miscavige, people would be like oh, sniggering and talking about him. You know, I wish I could understand how that dynamic works. Um... It's, it's such a strange phenomenon because even, even with, I, I think the press just wants to have access to him for his movies. There's a, there's a money factor to it being one of the biggest superstars, how he gets away with it. I don't know. I think some people just brush it off and assume that it's just crazy cult talk, but the, I mean, I, I've met his, I've met Tom Cruise's sister before his former, and, and she was his former press agent as well. I mean, this guy goes through family members like Dave goes through staff members. I've heard from people that have worked or been associated with people that work in his office. He's as tyrannical, if not more than David Miscavige. Wow. Can you imagine working for someone like that? I mean, he, he really did remove his own sister from the, from the press agent uh, position, which is crazy when you think about it, why he even had her there in the first place after yeah. getting rid of Pat Kingsley. But um, yeah, I've heard he's a tyrant like that, which was sad because as, as a child, before I knew uh, Tom Cruise was even a Scientologist, I was a giant fan, Top Gun being one of my favorite movies of all time. But uh, no, I don't know how he gets around that. Um, but I think it did have an effect on his last movie a little bit. Uh, I didn't see it, Mission Impossible. But mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to eventually catch up to him just because of social media, because of YouTube. Uh, I do a whole little section on my channel called Stupid Stuff That Tom Cruise Says. Because um, <laughs> he does say a lot of stupid stuff. But uh, yeah, I think it's going to catch up to him eventually. And, and you know what? In the end, unless he disavows Scientology at some point, that's going to—that's what partly what he's going to be remembered for, which is kind of sad considering he does have a pretty good set of movies he's made over his career. He's going to be remembered for being that that other guy in the cult. Uh, what are some? Or, what's or one Dave's of little bitch? Yeah. <laughs> what's the? What's maybe the one of the stupidest things he said? The one where he talked about uh, if there's an accident on the side of the road, if there's if there's something that uh, happens, only us, because we know only Scientologists can truly, yes. truly help. And I, I've had arguments say that, well, he didn't really mean that. But yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. He didn't say directly, don't have an EMT or a fireman or or emergency services help out when it's a major injury, but he really was kind of saying that. And even if yeah. he didn't mean it exactly that way, the way that message was conveyed was that. And yeah, so that's one of the stupidest things ever. How could you say that? How could you make that as, as, as a broad statement? Uh, and now that video wasn't supposed to be public, of course. It was supposed to be just be for Sea Organ Scientologists. But um, nonetheless, it was, it was a really stupid thing to say. I like that bit where it's like, you can be Jewish and Scientologist. You can be uh, <laughs> Christian and a Scientologist. It's like, well, you obviously can't because Penelope Cruz, wasn't she a Buddhist? And it was like a problem that she was a Scientologist in Scientology. Yes. It's the, it's the biggest lie that they like that they put out that you could be these other things and be a scientist. Absolutely not. 100% not. I even remember, I mean, you grew up a little bit of as a religious bigot. If you grew up in Scientology, you believe that everyone else 
was an idiot for believing what they believed. Meanwhile, you didn't know that eventually you were going to get into aliens when you got to the top of it, but you believed that believing in Jesus made you made you crazy essentially. And it's so funny that they cover that up and they don't get a much as much attention as they should because they really think the rest of the religions in the world are just insanely stupid. Yeah. Well, it makes, I mean, that was it, wasn't it? That Lord Zenu got all the Thetans after throwing people into the volcanoes and put them in cinemas or movie theaters and had them watch those, like be brainwashed by Christianity. So of course, that's the bad guy. How can Tom Cruise get away with saying, and then when anyone else asks anything further, he's just, go look it up. Just go look it up in a book. You can read about it. It's like, no, you can't. You've got to keep giving loads of money if you want to do that. Bloody Tom Cruise. What's the most, or one of the most abusive things you've seen either Tom Cruise or David Miscavige do? What's something that's like, whoa. So I, I think what, and I'm going to go to Dave Miscavige because I don't have a, a personal experience with Tom Cruise. <clears throat> uh, I okay. didn't, I've just heard stories. But with David Miscavige, here's what I think the most abusive thing is for him. He had that property at Golden Air Productions with 500 or so staff, maybe, up, maybe even up to 800 at some point. We are talking, in the majority, most people that were there during the uh, mid-90s all the way up through 2005, 2010, we're talking about about a boatload of really good people that thought they were there to actually help everyone on this planet, that would do anything, that would work any hours to help people out and ask for nothing in return. And somehow he still found it appropriate to mistreat those people and make them feel like they were lesser than, to yell at them, to to, um, abuse them, in so many different ways, mentally, physically, deprivation. We were on a property that was arguably one of the most beautiful properties I've ever stepped onto, but we couldn't even use the facilities there uh, for the majority of the time we were there. So the beatings is one thing, and I get that. It takes a long time to recover from that, and, and a lot of attention goes to that. But how he treated people that were essentially volunteers and would have done anything for him, if he had just been nice and made the environment okay, and given everyone a day off every other week or every week, that place could have been a paradise and they would have kept working there forever. Instead, because of his narcissistic personality, he decided to abuse people mentally and physically. And now everyone that's out here speaking against him is solely because of that. Everyone Mm. has a direct line back to David Miscavige and an experience they had with him that's prompting them to speak out right now. And to me, that shows one, he's an idiot, and not the smartest guy in the world. But two, he's just an evil bastard that that had no reason to do that to people that were completely dedicated and there to do a good job. Yeah, it's something I've noticed as well. A lot of ex-Scientologists say, you know, I'd still be there if I wasn't treated so badly. Um, I do wonder if the cult can exist at all without some horrible person at the top of it. Because so you never really see an example of a cult being led by really wonderful people. I suppose once you start being nice, people start to ask more questions about their individual liberties and the whole thing falls apart. So I think you have to be a psychopathic despot for the I whole agree. thing to work. And, and Scientology has been going for a long time. And if you compare it to something like Nixium, which lasted a few years really, uh, not that, not because Keith Raniere was any nicer. He was a horrible person as well. But uh, I, I think it's not easy... Um, to run a cult. Um, should we go to some comments and questions and things? Let's um, do it, absolutely. Great one. What, one of my favorite comments ever came in halfway through, and you've got to be ready for this. It's uh, Brianna Miller. Why is Sterling so hot? <laughs> uh, not answering that. It's, it, it's uh, you know, I don't think I'm hot. So, uh, But thank you so much for the compliment. <laughs> it rem- reminds me of, um, not, not that I've seen it, of course, many times, but uh, Mean Girls, when somebody says... Uh, something like you're really cute or something and she says oh thank you and then the other one says oh right so you admit that you think you're cute do you and like they're all horrible to her that's um so it's so hard to answer or yeah acknowledge that i agree yeah it's <laughs> apparently i have a little bit of a fan club but that's okay you know anyway. yeah this one's just a comment from from miss d and that's uh saying chris guider is not a nice man he sent someone i know to the rpf based on a false report he lied what's the rpf uh, that's the rehabilitation project force. That is the the penalty or the the uh, the heavy um, work that you have to do in the uh, correction program that is apparently doesn't exist anymore, but was mm. was one of the worst parts of the C organization. Actually, uh, I don't know what uh, L. Ron Hubbard was thinking of when he came up with that idea. It's it's a terrible, terrible thing. But yeah. Mm. 
ART writes, I read his niece's book years ago, that'd be Jenna Miscavige, and never gave another dime to any Scientologist actor or actress. What they do to the kids is disgusting. Um, are you still in touch with Jenna, Jenna Miscavige? What's, what's she like? Uh, I am still in touch with her. Uh, you know, we're family, so we don't always see eye to eye, <laughs> as that can be. But I'm, I'm in touch with her. Um, I would like to be more than I am. But, you know, I'm yeah. closer to my twin brother than, than any one of my other siblings. Uh, but her book, guys, is fantastic. It's a great, great book. If you haven't read it, there, there's a lot of them now that are out that, that paint wonderful pictures, including Mitch Brisker's new book which I also am in the middle of reading, which is really, really good insight into David Miscavige and how he treated, because Mitch got to see how he treated uh, outside contractors, got to see how he treated celebrities and got to see how he treated the staff at Golden Air Productions, which is a view that you don't usually see. So it's fantastic. But um, you know, her book's fantastic, guys. If you haven't read it already, I think, I, if you don't mind, I have it right here. Yeah, there we hmm. go. I always have a copy of it. There so oh, there we go. Get, get yeah. hold of it, guys. Get a hold yeah, of that. Yeah, really good book. Um, it's not just about your looks, by the way. Mark Marco says, this guy is pretty dang cool. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had people fawning over a guest. They're falling over themselves for you. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm just going to blush. Um, like, yeah. yeah, okay, that's all. They like, they like you. They like you. Brianna <laughs> Miller says, didn't Tom Cruise make everyone on his movie sets read Dianetics or he wouldn't work with them? Is that true? I've heard bits like that. I don't know. I don't know that's true. I couldn't comment on it. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, one for me from Alicia that I appreciate. Don't uh, Please don't take to heart what trolls post about you. It's not accurate. Uh, I do appreciate that. A lot of people were upset with me uh, in my, my video yesterday about uh, Doug Scott Kramer, who very sadly passed away. I wrongly speculated that he might have taken his own life because he was so young. Uh, and looked healthy and I know he had a lot of troubles and things and it looks like from the reports that came out afterwards he actually had a heart attack which in some respects is is less sad at least you know he wasn't so sad that he took his life and then in another respect is even sadder because you know he didn't want to go and he was rekindling a relationship with his mother and it's just uh incredibly sad I don't know do you have any and we'll never about? know we'll never know for sure the trauma that he was processing inside and that that is an after effect of Scientology and I think any loss of human life uh, is is tragic, but losing someone that that was still dealing with trauma at that time it is really sad. I didn't know Doug, uh, but that's never a good thing, and, and I'm sorry to hear of his loss. Yeah. No, it's really, really, really sad. And uh, yeah. yeah, there was a lot of unfinished stuff that he wanted to do, and all of those things. But anyway, um, you know, uh, Sterling, uh, tell us where people should go and check out your channel and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, yes. So I have a YouTube channel. I started about three months ago. Uh, Aaron finally twisted my arm hard enough to get me to start it. Uh, and I always, I always <laughs> say thank you. And I appreciate that Aaron, cause it's actually been quite therapeutic and enjoyable. Again, my channel does focus on moving, uh, exposing Scientology, but also moving forward after living your life and, and ho helping people understand that they, they don't have to flip burgers. They can actually live their life if they put some work into it and, and kind of go towards the goals they'd like to. So my YouTube channel is called Leaving Scientology and Loving Life, or it's actually Leaving Scientology, Loving Life. You can also find that. me at Sterling Tompkins. Uh, I'm, I think I'm the only Sterling Tompkins that exists in the world at this particular point in time, which yeah. is good. Um, but yeah, that's my channel and I do a lot of content. We do, we do a, we do an ex member, uh, game night on Wednesdays, which is a blast. Um, I interview with relatable Reese who, you know, every Sunday and then otherwise my content is just, I try to do interviews with people and, and kind of expand, uh, you know, my palette of different, uh, content. So, yeah. Oh, well, guys, I, I, you know, I know Sterling's channel well. I was looking at it a lot in researching this. It's wonderful. He's brilliant. Isn't it great what what Aaron does, by the way? That Because a lot of YouTube, and I do know people like this, I'm not going to name them, they just want it all for themselves. And it's understandable as well because that's that becomes your living, you know? And a lot, a lot of people yeah. watching might not be YouTubers, but they do another job. And I've seen it in other jobs as well where people have not lifted people up. I'm a strong believer that even if you are secretly a psychopath or a narcissist, that you should lift people up because they'll <laughs> help you on the way up. So even if you are a horrible right. guy, it's still worth doing. But Aaron really, really does care. Uh, 
and I love that. And I love that he wants you to succeed. And I think you, and I know you will. And I, they, that, that will help. That will start from people going over to your channel. There is a link below in the description and hitting that subscribe button, watching and joining in with, with all the stuff. Guys, uh, if you're here, hit the like button on this video. That helps it get out into the algorithm. I just watched a whole video about that. Apparently, the like button does something, as does hitting the subscribe button and all those kinds of things. It's a big help. Comment down below your thoughts and keep on watching this channel and go over to Sterling's as well. Um, yeah, that's that's what that's Andrew, what thank say. you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Again, I've loved your content since day one. Uh, thanks for giving me a chance to use my voice. And uh, hopefully in the future, we can do some uh, content if I come up with something that you might be interested in. I think that would be great. Well, thank you. Oh.